Good morning, everybody. Ah, oh, you are alive. Good morning. So um, I'm just going to give you a bit of background, and then I'm going to tell you a story, if that's acceptable to you. Is it? Okay, so I became a storyteller 28 years ago. I know I look young, but I'm actually a lot older than I look. Uh, and when I became a storyteller, the time that I became a storyteller, um, I was going through, I was quite a troubled young woman, mainly because being second generation, um, from a second generation migrant family in England, it's quite challenging to know who you are, where you're from, where to call home. Uh, when your parents talk about home as being somewhere else other than the place that you live in, other than the place that you're educated in, it's quite challenging to have a, a, a very uh, strong sense of identity. So by the time I became a storyteller, I was known, my nickname was the small black cloud because I was always in a funk, I was always very angry and um, very combative, and I would say very defensive, uh, very self-protective, because racism can get into your head and, and mess you up. And that's where I was. Uh, then I, I became a storyteller, mainly for financial reasons. I was broke. Someone suggested I could make 20 pounds an hour as a storyteller. I said, that's the job for me. And I pursued a career as a storyteller. And I was encouraged by a woman called Eno Saucy, to really embrace storytelling, to embrace my own culture through storytelling. And it was through embracing my own culture through storytelling, through telling stories, singing songs, rhymes and riddles, playground games, things that I hadn't actually had access to in England, but were from my parents' tradition, suddenly something within me opened. Something within me softened. I felt more connected with people because I, I felt I had more access to the things that made me, me, even though I didn't quite know who me was before that time. When I started storytelling, I, cho I chose stories that were quite shallow, really. But that's because at the time I was quite young and I didn't really have a grasp on the world or my place in it. As I developed as a human being, as I read more stories, as I heard more stories, as I immersed myself in more stories, as I grew up, as I became a mother, I was able to tell stories with a bit more gravitas. And I was able to come to an understanding of what my role was as a storyteller. Yes, stories are entertaining. I'm an entertaining storyteller. Well, I hope you think that when I finished. But the most important thing that I discovered is that, as a storyteller, my role is fundamentally to embrace the other. When I'm in a room full of people and I say, once upon a time, what I'm saying is, at this moment, everything that you are, good, bad, indifferent, is acceptable. Right here and right now. The story that I tell, the stories that I tell, are a reflection of who we are, who we could be, who we maybe shouldn't be. But at the moment that we're all in the room together, everything out there can stop, you can relax. Everything that you are is all right. I will hold up a mirror. I will show you where we're at, or as I said earlier, where we could be. But for this moment, it's all right just to be you. It's all right just to be me. I'm not separate from you in any way. I am you, you are me, and we're going to share, and we're going to swim together in this wellspring of humanity. That's what I believe my role is. When I began, all I wanted was the 20 pounds an hour. Now, what I want to do is embrace everybody, give everybody permission just to be a flawed human being but with possibilities, with potential, and with hope. Does that make sense to you? Yes? You're very quiet for an audience. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, good. So, with that in mind, I'd like to share with you one of the stories that I heard from the woman I mentioned earlier, Eno Saucy. 
It's a story that I think is about what happens when you don't embrace the other, when you make a separation between yourself and someone else, when you're not able to recognize in other human beings the same hopes, dreams, and desires. Yes, we're all unique, as Rafe said earlier, but fundamentally, love, hate, death, loss, betrayal, need, fear, we're all wrestling with those things all the time, are we not? Thank you. <laughs> and so, I would like to share this story with you. If you want to hear the story when I say crick, you say crack, okay? Crick. And the way you say crack is an indication to me of whether or not you just want me to get off the stage or tell you a story. Crick. crack. I'm not convinced. <laughs> crick. Crack. Crick. Crack. Crack. Crick. Crack. Once upon a time, a camel driver was leading his caravan of camels from his town through a small village on his way to Baghdad to sell. As he made his way through the small village, he noticed a walled orchard. And he knew it was an orchard because hanging over the wall of the orchard was the branch of a tree, and hanging from that branch were three sweet, juicy, succulent peaches. Can you taste them? They were so succulent and so juicy that one of them had split its skin and the juice was dripping down onto the ground and the ants were gathering and drinking from that sweet nectar. When the camel driver saw the walled orchard, he was suddenly gripped with a terrible envy. He said to himself, some people are lucky. Some people have the ability to stay in one place and make their living. Some people, they're able to spend their days with their family. They don't have to spend their days on the road, days upon days upon days, alone, without the comfort of a loving wife. Meantime, the orchard owner was sitting, looking through the open gateway of his orchard, and he saw the camel driver, and he saw that caravan of the most beautiful camels, and he said, look at that. Some people, they're very lucky. They have the opportunity to travel this vast land and learn new things, whereas I'm stuck, rooted to the spot. It's not fair. The lead camel had spotted those three juicy peaches. The lead camel stretched its neck and broke off the branch and consumed those juicy peaches. And when the orchard owner saw that, he was gripped with a fury. He picked up a stone and he threw it at the camel. It hit the camel in the forehead. The camel fell dead. The, ca the camel driver, when he saw his dead camel, his best camel, he was furious. He picked up a stone and he launched it at the orchard owner. The orchard owner turned away, but not quickly enough. It struck him in the temple. He fell dead on the spot. Now, a dead camel is one thing. A dead man is something entirely different. And the camel driver was suddenly gripped with fear. He looked around, hoping no one had seen him. Then he took his knife, and he cut the rope that tied the first camel to the second camel, and he tried to lead the caravan away. But he had been seen. He'd been seen by the sons of the orchard owner, and they ran out the orchard, and they laid hands upon him. They said, murderer, murderer, you killed our father. The camel driver, he fell to his knees, and he said, I'm sorry. It, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't want to kill your father. But look, and he produced a purse full of gold. He said, I have blood money. I can pay for the life of your father. They said, we don't want blood money. Blood money, no. Blood, yes. A life for a life. You killed our father. Never again will we experience sitting with our father at the cafe, drinking hot sweet coffee and playing backgammon because of you. Never again will we harvest our peaches and take them to the market with our father because of you. We don't want your blood money. We want your life. And they dragged him through the streets. A crowd gathered behind them. Where are you going, they said. To the judge, they said, and explained why. Soon, they were at the house of the judge. The judge came out. He said, what's the matter? This man, said the sons, this man killed our father. We want his life. Wait, said the judge. The judge turned to the camel driver. He said, my friend, you've offended these men. You have killed their father, and they want your life. Do you have anything to say? He 
He said, please, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. He killed my camel. It was a reflex action. I threw the stone. I killed him. But I, look, and he showed the gold. He said, I have blood money. I can pay for the life of their father. Wait, said the judge. He turned to the sons of the orchard owner and he said, this man didn't mean to kill your father. It was an accident. He has blood money. Will you accept? No, we don't want his blood money. We don't want his blood money. We want his blood. Life for a life, a death for a death. He must die, and he must die today. Wait, said the judge. And he turned back to the camel driver and he said, my friend, I'm sorry. These men do not want your gold. These men want your blood. You kill their father, and they have a right to ask, I'm sorry. He clicked his fingers, and out came the executioner with his scimitar sharpened to perfection. He rolled out the sheepskin rug in front of the camel driver, and he said, my friend, fall to your knees, make your peace with your maker, say your prayers, and prepare to die. The camel driver's stomach was turning over and over. What could he do? He fell to his knees, and he began his prayers. He looked to the angel on his right shoulder. He looked to the angel on his left shoulder. He looked to the angel, and then he said, wait, wait. I'm a condemned man, am I not? You are, said the judge. A condemned man has a last request, does he not? He does, said the judge. Then I have one. I, I wish to go home, he said. I wish to go home for three days and three nights, and then I promise to return. <laughs> That's an unorthodox request, said the judge. Never has a condemned man asked to go home. Why should I trust that you'll return? Because I said I will, said the camel driver. Please, I can't let you go just like that, said the judge. I'm sorry. But if one of these good people gathered here is willing to take your place for three days and three nights and you return within the allotted time, then you may go. Ask. So the camel driver, he stood up and he said, good people, I ask if there's anyone who here is willing to take my place for the three days and the three nights until I return. <laughs> said the people. You, a murderer, you come here, a stranger, you kill one of ours, and now you want to go home, and you want one of us to take your place? No, 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 no. Die, said one person. Accept your fate. But there was one voice from the very, very back of the crowd. I'll take his place, said one voice. And everybody swung around, and there was an old man with long gray hair and a long gray beard, and he was elbowing his way through the crowd. I'll take his place. And the people, as he was going, they tried to stop him. They said, old man, what are you doing? You don't know this man. You don't owe him anything. Where are you going? He said, I know what I'm doing. And soon he was standing before the judge. He said, I'll take his place. The judge said, old man, you understand that if you take his place and he does not return, your life will be forfeit. I know, said the old man, but I'll take his place. Very well. It's settled, said the judge. And so the camel driver was given one of his camels. He jumped on that camel and he was gone. The old man, he had his hands bound and he was taken down to the dungeons. And the people, they walked away, shaking their heads and saying, we'll never see that man again. And that old man, he's given his life for nothing. One day passed. Two days passed. Three days passed. Three days and three nights Still, there was no sign of the camel driver. On the fourth morning, the old man was brought up from the dungeons. By this time, word had spread far and wide. Crowds had come from thither and yon, and they were standing there in front of the judge's house. The judge said to the old man, Old man, I'm sorry, you put your trust in the wrong person. The camel driver has not returned. Your life is forfeit. He called for the executioner. The executioner rolled out the sheepskin rug. He said, old man, say your prayers. Prepare to meet your maker. Today you die. I'm willing to die, said the old man. And he fell to his knees, and he began his prayers. And when he was in the middle of his prayers, he realized something. He realized that his life was nothing. He realized that his life was everything. And he was glad. And he was at peace. And when he finished, he turned to the executioner 
And he said, strike hard and true. I want to die instantly. The executioner rested the scimitar on the back of the old man's neck. He raised it high, he was about to strike when someone said, stop, someone's coming. And they looked up and they saw a big cloud of dust being kicked up. Someone was galloping furiously on the back of a camel, their face covered against the dust and the dirt of the road. This person rode in through the crowd, jumped down off the camel, ran to the old man, took him by the elbows, he lifted him up and he said, old man, I'm sorry. He removed his face covering to reveal that it was the camel driver. The whole crowd said, oh my God, it's a camel driver, he came back. Can you believe he came back? I wouldn't come back. Would you come back? <laughs> there was the camel driver. And he said, I'm sorry, old man, if I've caused you any distress. It wasn't my intention. But I'm here now. And I'm prepared to die. And he went down on his knees. Wait, said the judge. Wait. What just happened? Why did you come back? Where have you been? He said, I'm sorry. In my village, there was an old widow woman, and the old widow woman had entrusted her jewels to me, and I was the only one who knew where they were. If I had died here, nobody would have been able to re return those jewels to her. I would have been called a thief. My sons, for seven generations, would have been known as thieves. No, I couldn't have that. So I went home, I returned her jewels, I took leave of my wife, I took leave of my son and my son. He was devastated to hear that he would never see me again. He clung, clung to me. I put him to bed. I, I sang to him. I told him stories. And when he was sleeping, I said a final goodbye to my wife. I jumped on my camel, and I came here as quickly as I could. But it's all right now. I'm ready to die. And he went back to his prayers. Wait, said the judge. Wait. Old man, why did you offer to take his place? The old man said, I was raised in a time when a man's word meant everything. I was raised to believe that a man's word is his honor. He said he would come back. I chose to believe him. If, however, he'd not returned, I would have rather died than live in a world where what I've learned means nothing, where a man's word means nothing. I see, said the judge. Impressive. Well, I was taught that without compassion and mercy, there can be no true judgment. And so I declare today, no heads will roll, no blood will be spilt. And he turned to the sons of the orchard owner and he said, you will accept blood money for the life of your father, will you not? And they said, yes, we will. Good, said the judge. Then it's decided. Let's go into the house. We'll drink pomegranate wine, we'll eat food, we'll weigh the gold and we'll talk about life. And that's exactly what they did. And that, my friends, is the end of my story. Thank you for listening. Thank you.